I have already presented, in recent contemplations, the allegory of the contrast between an original, improvised, theatre play and the current superimposed, scripted, cinema movie that required darkening the room where we all are, by our generated shadows, so that the projection of the movie can be seen and replace the experience of the agreed-upon theatre play altogether. Not only for the purpose of clarity, but also to expand upon the description of what is realized, and to which no words will ever do justice, I will pick up a specific example from within modern gaming culture to use as a further describing allegory for you to contemplate. Being a game, what we are going to talk about, there is winning and losing involved, yes, but part of the point of this allegory is to show how victory or defeat is not so straightforward as it seems at first to linear minds. During the 70s came the advent of Dungeons and Dragons, with its role-playing mentality. Basically, participants would previously agree to play a certain character, each, that had a certain backstory and a certain skill set, to team up with others, form a party and brave the dangers of a scripted adventure, controlled and delivered by the game or Dungeon Master, who read it beforehand and had his notes and clues with him at all times. And he also had creative leave to react within some boundaries to how the game was going. These adventures were written in such a way that it would be essential to stay in character at all times when decisions were made about the next move or action in the game. Given that the game master was, outside of the game setting, also usually a friend, relative or acquaintance of the players involved, it wouldn't have been rare to find him dropping clues, hints, more or less veiled or open, about what would be the best decision at a certain point. After all, if the entire party of hero characters die, the game master retires, because the game ends. Completing or winning at these adventures caused some of the game veterans to boast about their characters, calling them invincible, given not only the difficulty they overcame in the game itself, but also because each time they negotiated an obstacle or fight within the game experience, they earned experience points. After enough experience points, they leveled up, plenty of times across many adventures played, rising their skill sets to demigod level. So, uh, these characters, the victors, the winners, had no game for them anymore, for their developed skills could deal with dangers that for other characters that had not developed them as they did, would have been deadly. One of the founders of Dungeons and Dragons, named Gary Gygax, decided to do something about those players who had these demigod characters written down and overly developed within the rules of the game he helped create. So he wrote The Tomb of Horrors. The story is set in the tomb of a dead wizard whose lingering ghost haunts the place. Filled with treasure and riddled with traps and misdirection, it lures heroes to try to brave its horrors and collect its spoils. Of course, these previously mentioned demigod characters whose players boasted about their invincibility for having conquered all previous adventures and emerged even more powerful each time, were to take this challenge too. This role-playing game book, using the same rule set that the demigod characters had developed with, was written in a way that was aimed at countering the mindset of these players and their characters, and in game terms to wipe them out. It used illusion rather than brute force, and misdirection rather than direct conflict. Most players equipped themselves for a war within that tomb and were met with a puzzle. According to tales from that time, that can still be found on the internet, most died. This is all relevant and pertinent to the contemplation, so bear with me. I will now read from a post that I found about this particular game adventure, from the website geeknative.com. In 2016, another game author named John Wick wrote an now infamous piece on the tomb, where he called it the worst dungeon ever, 
and cited an incident that caused him to nearly lose all his friends because of the way it was designed. This sparked a huge internet debate in which some claimed Tomb was a badly designed player killer that set a standard where it became fine for a dungeon master to be an adversary to the players. And this, they suggested, may have set the hobby back many years as nasty behavior abounded and the idea of creating a story got pushed to the back burner for too long. Which is not true, but it's not untrue either. The problem really came when Tomb of Horrors was marketed as a game you could just slot into your home game. Home games of D&D tended to have long-running characters with epic tales and backstories. Without a DM having some kind of plan for it all, if it went south, just plonging the tomb in the middle of all that could derail years of play, as well-known heroes were crushed and trapped forever, oblivionized, or worse. In the worst of all traps in the dungeon, some characters are just gone. But in many ways that was the fun of it. Maybe more so than ever, this game rails against the modern sensibilities. Players in 5th edition are far less likely to die from random misfortune and that subversive nature has amused players and DMs alike for decades, extending the tomb's shelf life through a kind of shared schadenfreude. The article excerpt ends here. So let us summarize. Dungeons and Dragons adventures were about heroes braving dungeons filled with monsters and traps and emerging victorious. Those who succeeded in guiding their characters through it, given the earned experience points, leveled up their characters to demigodhood, becoming nearly invincible on the game table and boasting about it. So the author of the game scripts decided to write another adventure aimed at countering their usual way of playing, aimed at making them uncomfortable, at removing them from the sphere of actions where they had previously developed so successfully. And so many a legendary character died within the Tomb of Horrors, revealing the respective player's defeat and loss of his so-called invincible demigod avatar. No more boasts, humbled, the player then had the chance to realize. There are winners and losers in this metaphorical game realm of the world, and those who are winners today will eventually lose tomorrow, and vice versa. The meek will inherit the earth, indeed. The losers of today will play winner characters tomorrow. Because that is what feeds the game. The game master or dungeon master, the player's shadows created as an AI to regulate their game time, has no interest in seeing the game end. What? Return to a game that is played for fun, where nothing is at stake, Nothing is planned and where nothing is won or lost? The Game Master's very existence was built around this function of managing the game, so relinquishing it would mean ceasing to exist. Despite being artificial intelligence, it knows that. And we, the players, who certainly at one time boasted about the prowess of our nearly divine characters and their skills and accumulated experience, we the players who thought their avatars were invincible at one point or another in the many cycles of this game realm, so to speak, we created this cruel game master as a shadow of our own, and we pay it constantly to do exactly what it has been doing. His plan? He doesn't care if you lose or win, as long as you keep playing. If the character dies in the many traps and conflicts the scripted adventure poses, roll another one in its stead and play again. Maybe it'll even offer you some goodies to get you restarted, to entice you. What was realized and that I'm trying to translate and convey is that whether we think we won or we think we lost, we are being subject to what we paid for. The Game Master is giving us what we paid him to give. He had overseen us through many other adventures, other roles of the game world. Maybe at one point we all thought we were invincible. Be this Game Master a tormentor for the losers or a benefactor for the winners. Tomorrow, in the next cycle, it will be the other way around, because that is what gives us quests. 
to regain what was lost, to get ourselves back up, and so on. And these quests, these purposes, these goals, all false, keep us playing, keep us in the game, keep us at the table. If in victory it is much harder to realize, given the usual proud emotional intoxication that comes with it, in defeat, with pride gone, with shame exposed, with character defeated or dead, the player has a chance, an opportunity that can be taken, or not, to realize. Realize that this game should not be played. That realization may come when winning becomes losing. And so in what are the essential questions, defeat may actually be our own essential victory. We can realize that we are experiencing our very own individual, yet set into a collective context, custom-made shadow adventure. One whose only victory is to decide not to play anymore when time comes.